This is the final go no go poll for Starship. Anybody two? Go. Stage one? Go. Stage two? Go. Flight directors, go for push. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy. This is Rocket Science, and in this lesson, we are going to take a look at the technology behind the advances that make spaceflight possible. It is an amazing time in human history. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, ignition, and liftoff of Starliner and Atlas V carrying two American heroes, drawing a line to the stars for all of us. The United States now has two crewed spacecraft to get people to and from the International Space Station. And China has successfully sent another robotic mission to the moon, landing the 3,200 kilogram Chang'e 6 on the far side. It was launched on a Long March 5 rocket on the 3rd of May, 2024. The Long March 5 is the most capable rocket China has right now, modeled a little bit on the Soviet Energia rocket system, but much smaller. It has four RP-1 fueled boosters, helping to lift a hydrogen fueled center stage. The second stage is also hydrogen fueled, with an optional hypergolic third stage. It can get up to 25 metric tons to low Earth orbit, and up to 9.4 on a translunar trajectory. Chang'e 6 has a launch mass of 8.2 metric tons, and it has four modules, an orbiter, a lander, an ascender, and a return vehicle. The orbiter and return vehicle stay in lunar orbit, while the lander and ascent vehicle, with a mass of 3.2 metric tons, comes down at the South Pole's Aiken Basin, about here, where it collected a couple of kilograms of regolith and drilling samples, sending them up to orbit with the ascender which docked with the return vehicle, transferred samples, and then sent them back to Earth. Very similar to the Apollo mission architecture, just on a smaller scale. This was not just a Chinese mission, but really an international collaboration. One instrument on board is from France, another is from Sweden, with laser reflectors from Italy, and a CubeSat called iCubeQ from Pakistan. Chang'e 6 reached the moon on the 8th of May and went into lunar orbit. For 20 days, it scanned for a landing site. Then the lander separated and began a 15-minute landing sequence, coming down on the 1st of June Universal Time, the 2nd of June Beijing Time. Those samples were collected and the ascent vehicle lifted off on the 3rd of June, docking with the return vehicle and transferring about 2 kilograms of samples, which will be returned to Earth around the 25th of June, just like the Chang'e 5 mission on the near side. On the American side, the Starliner spaceship carrying two American astronauts was lifted to orbit by an Atlas V rocket. The Atlas V is 52.4 meters tall, counting Starliner, and has a launch mass of 590 metric tons, a little more than the SpaceX Falcon 9, which is 549 metric tons. But while the Falcon 9 is powered by nine Merlin engines, the Atlas V is lifted with a single RD-180 with the help of some solid propellant boosters. The RD-180 is the two-chambered version of the larger four-chambered RD-170. Despite four combustion chambers and nozzles, has a single turbo pump and is therefore considered a single engine. The massive RD-170 was used on the Soviet Energia rocket system, the inspiration for the much less capable Long March 5. The Energia only launched twice before the Soviet Union collapsed and the RP-1-fueled RD-170, with its oxygen-rich stage combustion cycle, even more powerful and efficient than the Saturn V F-1, was retired. These engines were designed for potential reuse of up to 20 burns, and had been planned to lead to the Hurricane, or Energia 2, an almost fully reusable rocket system, seen here brought to life by the beautiful work of the artist Hayes Grayart. This would have had a total launch thrust of almost 80 meganewtons and could have lifted up to 200 metric tons to low Earth orbit. 
But all this was lost with the fall of the Soviet Union, and the RD-170 was essentially cut in half to make the RD-180, which has been powering Atlas and Antares rockets for decades. But its days are numbered on American rockets. Right now, 16 Atlas launches remain. Six for Starliner, eight for Amazon's Kuiper Constellation, and two more. Starliner had been delayed several times because of valve problems, first on the Starliner itself, but then on the ground support equipment for Atlas. During the last stand-down, the Starliner service module was found to have a small helium leak. The valves were fixed and the leak seemed inconsequential, but once in orbit, it was found to have at least two more. To keep this from being a problem, the crew closed the valves to the helium manifolds while they waited for docking approval. A manifold takes several inputs and sends them in one direction, like this exhaust manifold, or receives one input and sends it in multiple directions, like the helium gas manifold on the Starliner. The Starliner engines are the simplest high thrust and efficiency rocket engines possible. Hypergolic. Hypergolic fuels explode when mixed, so there's no need for an ignition system. Most of these are toxic, but they don't have to be. The British Black Arrow rocket system, powered by the Gamma rocket engine, used high test peroxide and RP-1. By the way, the Gamma engine had eight combustion chambers and one turbo pump, therefore it was considered a single engine also. High test peroxide and RP-1 is self-igniting, so technically this is a hypergolic system, but propellants like hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide have better performance. The Starliner uses a service module for much of its propulsion in orbit. And this comes mainly from four Rocketdyne RS-88 engines. These can use ethanol and liquid oxygen, or monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. There are several different types of hydrazine, monomethyl, unsymmetric dimethyl, and mixtures of those. Just remember that it's two nitrogens with two hydrogens on each end in its simplest form. If you add a methyl group on one side, that's monomethyl hydrazine. If you add two methyl groups on opposite sides, that's unsymmetric dimethyl hydrogen. Almost always these are mixed with nitrogen tetroxide, which looks like this. On the Starliner, the hypergolic variant is used. And these engines are pressure fed. Pressure fed hypergolic engines are normally as dependable as it gets. You have a high pressure helium tank and a manifold with a valve between them. Opening this valve pressurizes the manifold. Here you see the manifold feeding high pressure helium to two tanks on this side and two more on this side. This side is for a small reaction control system engine, and this one is for a larger orbital maneuvering rocket engine. The manifold takes pressurized helium gas to each propellant tank, with safety valves to shut these off if there's a problem. There are different ways to do this. Here we see a secondary manifold distributing helium to the tanks. This is an isolation valve. If this tank ruptured, you wouldn't want to continue venting all your helium. If you shut it off up here, you will shut down all of these engines. The leak must have been on a flange on this side, which is why they kept saying a helium line to an RCS engine. Actually, it would be a helium pressure line to a propellant tank. Here are the hypergolic tanks, one for the MMH and one for the NTO. Once the propellant tanks are pressurized, you can open the valves down here to release the pressurized propellant into the combustion chamber, where they would spontaneously ignite. All of the rocket engines on the Starliner service module and capsule work this same way. The Starliner launched safely to orbit, but as it was getting ready to begin its docking maneuvers, the rocket engines were tested and five of them failed, reporting low chamber pressure. Was this due to the loss of pressurized helium in the manifold? Because this must maintain a certain amount of pressure in order to pressurize these, and if there's a leak that's losing too much helium, that could interfere with maintaining this pressure. The rendezvous process picks up after about 14 orbits and 21 hours into flight. At that point, the spacecraft is cruising a few hundred kilometers behind and below the station. It's time to start climbing. To do that, Starliner fires its Orbital Maneuvering and Attitude Control Thrusters, or OMAX, to begin the first height adjustment maneuvers. This first burn, NHPC-1, pushes Starliner slightly in front of, but still below the orbiting laboratory. Then, the next burn, NHPC-2, fires the OMAX for a few seconds, 
This move put Starliner within kilometers of station, but now Starliner is back behind it. The final height adjustment, NSRPC, is another short OMAC burn that places the vehicle on a co-elliptic path with the station's orbit. Now, Starliner is just outside the approach ellipsoid, with the Vesta cameras in the nose pointing straight at station. After a terminal phase rendezvous initiation, the proximity operations begin with a series of inbound fly-around maneuvers. Now, Starliner is just hundreds of meters away from station. Because the two vehicles are closer together, Starliner will only use its smaller reaction control system, or RCS thrusters, from here until docking. The first inbound fly-around maneuver, IF-1, swings Starliner 550 meters ahead of station and raises it another 300 meters. This maneuver accelerates Starliner to about 17,500 miles per hour, nearly matching the station's velocity. Inbound Flyer Round 2 raises Starliner further, moving into position 300 meters directly in front of station. Now, it's time for the initial approach. At approximately 250 meters, space station crew will manually command the Starliner to stop. This is just to verify that Starliner will obey that command if they need to issue it in the final docking phases. The approach corridor initiation burn sends Starliner into the keepout sphere, a 200 meter sphere that nothing is allowed to enter unless it plans to dock to station. Then, when Starliner is 182 meters away from station, it will automatically stop and retreat to 200 meters. Once again, this is just to prove that Starliner will execute a retreat if needed. Starliner will then continue its approach until it gets to within just 10 meters of station. Once more, it will pause and prepare the docking system for mating with the ISS until given the go-ahead for final approach. Finally, after hours of this perfectly choreographed orbital dance, Starliner will perform its final approach initiation maneuver. The vehicle will slowly close the final 10 meters until its docking system makes contact with the Boeing-built International Docking Adapter on the Harmony Modules Node 2. Then, Starliner's docking ring will retract, hooks engage, locking Starliner and station together, signifying a successful docking procedure. But once reset, four of these came online and the Starliner was cleared to dock with the ISS, after which a fourth helium leak was found. The valve up here has been shut off while the ship is docked. I really want America to have more than one crewed space vehicle, even if it costs twice as much as the competition. What I don't want is a space disaster that would set us back years. An uncontrolled pressure leak leading to rupture could endanger the ISS and the Starliner crew on return. I think the safest thing to do at this point is to keep the two Starliner astronauts on the ISS until they can return on a Soyuz or Dragon capsule and bring the Starliner back uncrewed. Maybe I'm being overly cautious, but we know what ignoring known dangers can cost us. Thiokol engineers warned NASA not to launch the shuttle when it was too cold, and we lost the Challenger with seven brave people on board. NASA noticed that a chunk of foam had hit the wing of Columbia on launch, and this was also ignored, leading to another disaster. But while we celebrate China's success and keep our fingers crossed for Starliner, we all saw the Starship Integrated Flight Test 4, launching successfully despite an engine out, and landing the booster despite an engine relight failure. And the Starship itself survived re-entry despite the burn-through of a forward flap. If Starship continues to progress, we will finally see that fully reusable 100 megaton, 200 metric tons to orbit rocket system that the Soviets dreamed of so long ago. Had they succeeded, they would have been decades ahead of us. And if we fail, others may end up decades ahead of us. We watched history being made and the age of starship is clearly here. And hopefully, the human diaspora into the solar system will follow quickly. Something to think about.
Thanks for listening. Join the Academy, keep in touch, and support our work on Patreon. We appreciate you. At Astro Proterra.